Salties, it's Caribbean Chris back with another episode of Salt Speak. Today I'm going to be chatting with Kara Rauch of KP Aquatics. We're going to be discussing fish and invertebrate collection in the Florida Keys, the types of rules and regulations involved with those practices, and other topics related to running a small family owned collection business in Florida. So stay tuned and I'll fill in any blanks after the chat. All right, Salties, today I'm here with Kara Rauch of KP Aquatics. How are you, Kara? Doing good, Chris. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. So right off the top, uh, can you give us a rundown of what KP Aquatics is and how you got started? Sure. Um, KP Aquatics um, actually started about almost 30 years ago with uh, Sea Life Inc. My, it was my father's business and um, he ran it for many years and in the last probably eight to ten years he's become increasingly busy with uh, coral restoration his nonprofit foundation and uh, his his mind changed from fish into a focus on just corals so um, I saw his business kind of uh, diminishing and I decided to keep the good thing that he had going um, on its feet and so my husband Philip and I took it over about four years ago and decided to change the name to KP Aquatics, which stands for both of our first names, Kara and Philip Aquatics. Awesome. Well, thanks for the rundown. So how would you characterize the level of interest in Florida and Caribbean livestock versus the Indo-Pacific stuff? Um, I think in the last I don't know, maybe 10 or so years, it's become increasingly more popular. Um, it used to be just the Indo-Pacific stuff, um, or mainly the Indo-Pacific stuff in the aquarium trade. And I think um, it's it's difficult to um, get a lot of really healthy uh, fish that are transported long time. <laughs> that are transported um, with such a long distance. Um, so I think the popularity of the Caribbean stuff has um, come up and has been increasingly it been increasing in demand um, over the last few years. Um, it's a lot less stress on the fish to get something a little more local than some of the fish that have to travel long distances. And yeah, things are changing. <laughs> awesome. So you kind of touched on it already with the benefit of less travel time to get to the states, but uh, are there any other benefits over Indo-Pacific livestock? Um, it's very different. Um, the Caribbean stuff is tends to be not as colorful, but we get a lot of really great blennies, a lot of uh, angelfish, and with the trend of the reef tanks becoming more popular rather than the fish-only tanks, um, we have a lot to offer in the Caribbean, a lot of great shrimps, a lot of uh, small fish, small blennies. Um, the jawfish are real popular for the reef tanks and, uh, you know, obviously recordias and zoanthids. Um, we get a lot of really nice blue zoanthids where I think the Indo-Pacific um, is kind of lacking as far as the blues for that aspect. Okay. So the next question is always pretty interesting for me when it comes to a small business, and I always uh, like to hear what folks have to say, but what's your typical weekly schedule? Now, and this is a big one when it comes to the Florida Keys, but weather permitting, what's your typical week? Um, we typically start out on Monday. We pack um, fish Mondays and Tuesdays um, of every week. Um, usually every other Monday we um, ship to pet stores, um, so then the re our retail orders are usually pushed off till Tuesday. Um, so then, weather permitting, <laughs> we usually use uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of diving. Um, sometimes it changes a little bit, but of course we have to go in and feed our fish every day, and uh, tank maintenance, uh, cleaning the tanks, you know, all the normal fun stuff that people in this trade get to deal with. <laughs> right. Okay, so as a collector, you're the holder of a commercial collector's license, which allows you to go out and collect these things for, for your uh, customers. But how do the uh, size and take limits and restrictions compare to, for instance, uh, what a recreational collector can do? The size limits stay the same. Um, we both have the same slide, size slots. Um, but the commercial collector can collect more of each item than a recreational collector can. Um, 
a lot of the rules have come up over the last probably 10 to 15 years to try to make this industry a very sustainable one. Um, it's a very good thing that we have, you know, size slots for the fish that we have, um, you know, a maximum amount of things that we can collect because it helps keep it sustainable here. And, um, you know, I'm part of the Florida Marine Life Association and they're the ones that have helped um, basically make suggestions to the fish and wildlife on what size restrictions we need as far as, you know, you don't want to collect a fish that's too small, that's not going to do well in a home aquarium. And, you know, you're also not going to want to collect something that's too big, that's, um, you know, maybe in breeding sizes, for example, like large angelfish, you want them to be able to still, you know, couple up and mate and have babies to keep the angelfish out there for us to get. Right. Awesome. So in terms of uh, you've had those restrictions that are put upon you by the license itself, are there any restrictions that you personally impose upon your business to, to improve upon the sustainability of your operation? Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously we stay within those strict restrictions um, put on by the FWC, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But um, for example, you know, certain times of the year we'll see um, yellow-headed jawfish that have eggs. Um, we're allowed to collect them with eggs, but we don't because, you know, you can go back there in a couple of weeks and see a bunch of little tiny babies. And right. why would I take them with eggs because they're probably not going to do well in my tank or anyone else's tank. So um, that's one of the examples. Um, you know, we also try not to go to the same spots over and over. We have, um, I don't even know, thousands of different places that we have marked in our GPS more often than others um, because we're, you know, maybe we're trying to get something more specific, but for a lot of places, we try not to go back to that same place for six months to a year to kind of let you know, if we took something away from there, let's let it come back and let's let it keep growing before we take, we don't want to take everything from every spot. We just would like to collect what we need and we can do that by going to many different places rather than just targeting certain areas. Okay, that sounds good. So in terms of taking the fish, what sorts of techniques do you use during collection? Um, we use hand nets for everything. Um, sometimes we use drop nets, but primarily every fish is caught with hand nets where we chase the fish down and <laughs> catch it. It's a lot of work, but also a lot of fun. I mean, every fish has a different type of behavior, so you kind of have to learn how to catch those different types of fish, because if you use the same technique for one fish, it might work, and then you try that same trick on the other fish and forget about it. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, that was, uh, when I went out collecting with the, you and Philip a couple of years ago, that's what I found was interesting, was watching how you each kind of did your own thing collecting until there was a certain species that would require both of you to try to outsmart it in order to collect it, and then you would come together and kind of team up to catch the fish, and I just thought that was pretty interesting watching you, you know, kind of go, go after what you needed in different ways and using def different techniques, you know, all while still using a net for everything, so. Right. It's a lot of fun. Ah, Sometimes definitely. communication underwater is tricky, but we've <laughs> gotten pretty good at hand signals and <laughs> trying to get the other person to understand what we're going after. <laughs> All right. Yes, the woes of diving, I guess. Uh, yeah. Uh, so in terms of those fish that you collect, what would you say is the toughest fish to collect? Um, basically, uh, any fish that just will swim and swim and swim and doesn't dart into a hole or dart into some place or stop. We kind of chase the fish and hope that it makes a stupid mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say um, a couple fish come to mind. Um, the tobacco bass are real tough because they like to just swim and swim and swim. Uh, um, it usually requires two people to catch that. Um, also the lightning wrasse, they do the same sort of thing. There's usually one at a time and they just take off. <laughs> And um, Creole wrasse are also pretty tough fish to catch because they just, there's, there's no, there's nothing that you can say this is how it's going to act every single time. Mm -hmm. it, they always do something different, so they're, they're tricky. <laughs> yeah, Creole wrasse, they just kind of like to get out in that open water and swim usually. And go every place but the net. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, well, that would make it easy for you if they did, so. Absolutely. Um, so I'm guessing this won't be the same fish, but what's your sa your favorite fish to collect? 
I really like um, catching the jawfish. I think mm -hmm. they're beautiful fish to watch in their natural environment and also in the aquarium. I just, I think they're really cute when they're really small. I, I don't know, I like to collect them because I like to watch them in their natural environment and I, they're just a fun fish to, to find and they're so cute. <laughs> yeah, they have, a, they have a lot of personality. In fact, uh, Jeff, the other half of Saltwater Smarts, that's his favorite fish is the jawfish. So. I can definitely appreciate that one. So. I would say it's my favorite fish, too. Awesome. Well, it's, it's a good choice. Yeah. So in terms of your collection areas, are they all in the upper keys, or do you collect elsewhere in the keys, or maybe on the Florida mainland at all? Um, we stay in the keys. We go from um, the upper keys down to Key West, actually. Um, each area we're trying to you know, certain things you find more of in Key West versus up here, mm -hmm. but um, we don't collect anything up um, off the mainland. Um, I guess if we needed something that only lived up there, we might just try to buy them from somebody else. But I mean, so far we haven't ran into a fish that we can't find down here that um, we sell. So I would say primarily we're in the upper keys, but we also go, you know, middle keys and farther south um, to get everything covered. Awesome. So, in addition to the, the Keys uh, livestock, do you import any specimens from other locales around the Caribbean? Um, we do import from, well, we don't import, but we buy from an importer okay. um, who gets things from Haiti. So, we um, sell royal gramas, um, black cat basslets. Um, those are fish that you don't find here. I think it gets too cold um, off the coast of Florida, but they can get them in Haiti. And those fish are actually found, I think, in the rest of the Caribbean, just mm -hmm. not off of Florida water. So we, um, we import those things. And also um, the pygmy angel fish are usually found in shallower water than they are, um, like down in Haiti, than they are in our area. So rather than going on a deeper dive and maybe getting a half a dozen pygmy angelfish on a whole dive, we, we focus to on like shallower water and we just buy those from Haiti. Oh, okay. Now, I believe the pygmies that you get from Haiti, aren't they a smaller strain than what's found in the Keys? I don't really know. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, see, I think it was mentioned on your site something about how they were typically smaller than uh, what had meant, and that may have been something that your, your dad put together uh, before, but yeah, it's... Uh, I've seen some of those in, in comparison to the ones that you get uh, elsewhere, you know, outside of Haiti. They seem like they don't get as big when they mm -hmm. are in adulthood. But anyway, yeah. so after you uh, go about your collections, how long do you keep the specimens at your facility in Key Largo before shipping them out to customers? Good question. We try to keep them for at least two weeks before we um, ship them out. We uh, keep all of our fish in medicated water. It's uh, medicated with um, nitrofurazone green, um, copper, and drawing a blank, uh, something for worms, uh, oh, okay. just in case. I mean, we all fish come from the ocean with something, or almost all fish have some kind of an issue. So we try to basically keep them in our warehouse till we see they're doing really well, they're eating, and then ship them out on top of you know, treating them for anything that they might have. Okay. Sounds good. So in terms of that shipment, what types of customers are you shipping to? I mean, are you doing hobbyists, local fish stores, uh, public aquariums, schools, the whole nine yards? Um, we do everything except we don't sell wholesale. We sell, um, obviously we have a website. We sell to universities, public aquariums, local fish stores, and also directly to the hobbyists. Okay. So um, we're, the only thing we're not doing is wholesale as well as we're not shipping overseas. Um, so far we haven't, there, there's a lot of additional charges to get the, the permits and um, everything to ship overseas. So, so far we haven't found an account that's uh, tempted us so much that we <laughs> felt like we needed to do it. But that might be something in the future for us. Okay, that makes sense. And, you know, I would really encourage anybody out there listening who's interested in uh, Caribbean specimens to get a hold of uh, KP Aquatics because uh, in my uh, Caribbean system, I would say, you know, three quarters of the specimens came from you guys and uh, they're, you know, they're more than willing to accommodate special requests for species. 
um, that you don't see very often in the trade. And uh, so it's definitely a great source for uh, livestock from that region. Uh, we do our best. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> yes, definitely. You do a great job. So uh, the last thing I have for you today is, you know, what's next for KP Aquatics? Is there, is there anything on the horizon, anything up your sleeve that uh, people can look out for? Um, well, we are always trying to educate ourselves as well as um, the public to um, how to keep a fish in their aquarium. So basically what we're trying to do is um, give more information on our website so that you know we ship a healthy fish to our customer and give them the resources so that they know how to keep that fish and you know what kind of habitat, what kind of things they need to do so that that fish can thrive in their home aquarium. Um, that's one of the things we're also um, working really hard um, with our live rock farm, trying to get um, really a nice quality of rock out there. Um, in the past four years, we have probably put 30,000 pounds of new rock out there. And um, we've worked really, really hard to find the best quality rock we can to get out there. Um, it's light. It's uh, lots of little holes for either fl frag plugs or for you know, fish to live in and it's growing a lot of coralline algae and, you know, in the next few years we are really hoping that we'll have a, a product, a real nice um, live rock product with really nice corals. I mean, the rocks have corals on it already, but it just, every year that it's down there, it just gets better and better. So that's the other thing we're really working on. Awesome. Well, that sounds great. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Kara, and uh, I really appreciate it. Great. Gladly. Talk to you later. All right. Bye. Bye. So there you have it. Fish, inverts, and aquacultured live rock direct from the Florida Keys. So, do you keep any Caribbean species in your reef systems? Tell us about it in the comments below. Also, I'll include some links to the KP Aquatics website and Facebook page for those interested in learning more. I have been Caribbean Chris Aldrich, this has been Salt Speak, and I'll see you next time.